Okay, everybody, here's the last of the China videos for now, at least. Um, and this one is more of a comparison between Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping. Um, going to be able to give you some of the answers here as we go along. I want to make sure you got these ones because this is kind of important. This is where you really should get a handle on how China became what they are today um, and really how they've really blended the ideas of Mao um, and the communist dictatorship um, with modern uh, economics, trying to be a modern economic country. Um, so first thing you need to understand here is this term gross domestic product up here on the top of the page. That is ba that is the total value of all goods and service produced in a country um, in a given time period, usually measured in a year. Um, it is a, 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 something that ec economists use to judge economic growth. You may hear that tossed around a little bit now in this time of coronavirus where we're worried about where our economy is going and how it's going to fare with all the business shutdowns and everything like that. Um, so if we look at this chart, this is China basically from 1952 to 2005. Um, you've got Mao's era in here, which is really the, the whole beginning up until 76 when he dies. Um, and then the time of Deng Xiaoping and his successors coming afterwards. Um, so if we look at the GDP during Mao's time, um, you guys all know how to read a graph. And when something is flat, it means it's not changing, uh, which means China's economy was barely growing at this point in time. Um, we see in 1980 that all of a sudden it begins to start growing. Um, and if you can, if you can see in here, it says farm privatization. Uh, this it means that this is when Deng starts instituting the policies of economic reform, start bringing in some market-based ideas where you, instead of government planning, you have um, the market starting to determine um, what is going to be bought and sold and, and uh, supplied uh, and produced in the country. And as you can see, the effect on China, um, at least economically, has been pretty good. China is now the second largest economy in the world, um, and they're cl closing in on the United States. Uh, probably within the next 15 or 20 years, they will at least meet or surpass us. Um, and some, some of it may depend a lot on how the different economies recover uh, from this coronavirus pandemic. Um, so who is Deng? Um, and yeah, that is how you say his name, Deng. Um, he's a prominent Chinese politician. He'd been around forever. He was, I think he was even on the long march and all that other stuff uh, when he was a very young man. Uh, but he takes over in 1978 after the death of Mao um, and really begins to start figuring out a way to make China prosperous because everything Mao tried didn't work. Um, and what they try to put into place is what he calls a socialist market economy, where you would still basically have the basic tenets of socialism, but you're going to allow the people running these things to decide what to grow um, and to sell and to make, um, opening up foreign trade, which Mao had cut off. Um, but you're not going to give people political freedom. Um, you're going to still keep tabs on freedom of speech and opposition to the rule. So most of what we're going to see the rest of the way here um, is that. So who was he? Who was Dung? That's up here in this first paragraph. And what he did um, are the bullet points and what comes after. All right. So the first big economic uh, plan of Deng Xiaoping is the four modernizations. Okay, and Deng realized that um, they needed to modernize pretty much all aspects of the economy. If you think about it, agriculture, industry, science, technology, and military, pretty much that's everything that a government uh, and that a country, um, at least economically, needs to, to worry about. So Mao's ideas, um, so Mao's answer to determining um, China's economic policies were to centrally plan these five-year plans and have these huge big programs like the front, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution um, and the use of communes, okay? Deng gets rid of that. Okay, he puts in this development of a socialist market economy, which takes the idea of government planning, but then brings in free market strategies in the forms of um, incentives and um, 
giving people a little bit of say in what they were actually going to produce. Um, this one gets into it a little bit more um, about this idea of planned centralized management of the economy, but it would, they, they had it done, it was done more by skilled, experienced people. It wasn't by political hacks who really maybe had have a handle on economics um, in there. Um, Mao's idea was the government would set the goals. This is, this is, should sound a little bit familiar from um, Stalin five-year plans because that's exactly what they went to and you were supposed to meet the quotas or you were punished and you were supposed to make what the government made even if there was no demand for it. Um, Dung says the way you motivate governments to work more instead of Mao's idea that you punish people who didn't make their quotas was um, to, to motivate them by giving them extra income by selling their stuff um, and to incentivize them to, to grow more stuff. The other side of that um, was the idea that you would sell some of this for export, okay, or to not just be self-sufficient. Um, Dung also shifted the industrial production. So this is your, um, your next modernization here, okay. Um, from Mao's idea was that China would be self-sufficient and that they would manufacture everything that they could possibly need in China uh, and wouldn't need to involve other countries, wouldn't need to bring in products from other countries. Um, Deng decided that to accelerate the modernization process, China needed foreign trade. Purchased some machinery from Japan and the West that they needed to make better quality products um, and then export that and sell it out to people. Um, take advantage of foreign investment, advanced technologies, professional management. Now, China has since, and maybe they were doing it during Deng's time, pretty much if you want to build something in China, you have to turn over to the Chinese government how you manufacture your projects, even if it's something that's maybe a technological secret and advantage that you have. And then this is where you've heard a lot about the Chinese making knockoffs and copies of stuff um, because they basically still stole the processes and then turned it out and, and sold it cheaper than the brand label. So the relationship with foreign countries would be Mao doesn't want to trade at all. China's closed to the outside world. Deng's answer is we need to trade with everybody and engage with them to gain their technical expertise so that we can eventually outcompete them. Okay, our next piece of the puzzle here is the political side of this. Okay, so you're preaching all this stuff about um, economic freedom, but they had no intention of giving the people political freedom. They still have no intention of giving the political freedom. This is some of how um, the coronavirus in China played out. They basically locked people in their towns and villages and told them they couldn't go anywhere. Um, and then they shut off. Uh, they, they basically didn't tell anybody around the world what was really going on. So um, kind of exacerbating the problem. Um, the biggest example, though, of China um, cracking down here, especially under Deng, is the Tiananmen Square protests. Okay, um, in 1989, this is uh, during the time period that I've already kind of mentioned a little bit, and we'll get into some detail of the collapse of uh, the Cold War in the Soviet Union um, at the, uh, in the in the Berlin Wall and all this other stuff. It's very 89 was a year of turmoil. Um, huge protest starts happening in Tiananmen Square, which this is a picture of Tiananmen Square right here. It's this huge, huge plaza in central Beijing, the capital of China. Um, and it's directly in front of what this is, this building here, which is known as the Great Hall of the People. This is basically uh, the Capitol building. This is, you know, for the United States, this is where the Chinese government lives all around this thing. So you begin to have a democracy protest breaking out there. And it's because of the death of um, a, a reforming politician who many saw maybe he was killed. Okay. Hundreds of thousands of students eventually march on Tiananmen Square and occupy it. And they begin building like, you know, just stuff. And one of the things they do is they build this paper mache Statue of Liberty, the goddess of democracy there. Uh, initially, Dung is, uh, lets it play out a little bit. Um, but then they decide that this is a threat to the political stability. And on May 20th, um, they declare martial law, which is basically 
Um, they suspend all laws and the military is in the street to enforce this. And they send the tanks into Beijing. And they don't bring the guys who are around Beijing who might know people and be a little bit more in this. They bring in troops from outside of Beijing who a uh, little bit more conservative, a little bit more in party control, and they run the t they drive the tanks right into the middle of this thing. Many people are killed. Um, numbers are all over the place, as you can see. Um, it, it could have been as many as 7,000 tortured and killed. Uh, there's a classic video, if you want to see something that gives you kind of a gist for it, called Tank Man. If you search it on YouTube when you're done watching this, it shows a guy basically trying to face down a Chinese tank. And it's a really interesting video um, that got out to the rest of the world. Following all of this, the government conducts a widespread arrest to suppress, torture, and kill any supporters of this movement. They limit access to the foreign press, and they control coverage in the mainland Chinese press. Violent suppression of this caused a widespread condemnation of China worldwide, and China still kind of suffers from this um, during this. So what were they protesting? The lack of rights and the government response by this huge government crackdown. So when you get down to here, we've looked at Mao and Deng economically very dissimilar. Um, I'm pretty sure you will say that their answer would be pretty much the same um, in their opposition to government policies. If you and the, you know if you violated, you didn't do what the government told you to do. Um, you were usually eventually lined up on a wall and shot. Okay, um, so we got a little bit of a summary task here. I've got a picture here that says Deng Xiaoping, and it says free markets, not people. And you can skip this see, think, wonder part. Um, basically. Just give me what you think based on the, the stuff above. Um, what's the car, contour, uh, cartoonist trying to say? Okay. And then you've got another Google form um, to do. And this one's a little shorter um, on Dung. Um, I think there's six or seven here for this one. Um, the, the, the picture here goes with these below. So once you're done with that, make sure you submit it um, and we'll be good to go. Any questions, check in with me on the Google Meet.